howdy, how you going? So I wanted to do something casual and look over five Netflix cartoons from 2018 that I've happened to be watching recently and that uh, I have good and bad thoughts on. And since none of these cartoons really fit into any best or worst or darkest cartoon list, which is most of what I do nowadays, I figured I'd just talk about them here. Anyway, let's review five modern Netflix cartoons. Also, I've moved my studio out to the lounge room just because it gets so hot in my house and I'm really tired of looking sweaty on camera over all these years, so that's the only reason I'm out here at the moment. Anyway, on to the sort of countdown? Kind of a countdown. Let's just go. Number five. Big Mouth Season 2. Guilty. 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 Andrew, Guilty. stop judging Guilty. yourself. Guilty. Big Mouth Season 2 is all about self-acceptance, and I really like that. And while there are some truly beautiful moments to Season 2, it still has its share of not-so-good, cringe-worthy moments in there that I don't know if everyone will tolerate. The worst part of Season 2 for me was actually one of the main characters, Nick. I really ended up hating Nick because he becomes such a selfish little twerp, using this young lady Gina like an object, and it's really cringeworthy. I'm not saying this isn't a realistic scenario. In fact, I realized while writing this that it reminded me too much of my teenage years and how angry and frustrated I would get at seeing men treat women like objects at that age. It's just, ugh. I really enjoyed the personal stories of characters like Jesse, Coach Steve, Missy and Gina, and Jay for that matter, who comes to terms with being bisexual, which is cool. Well then. In your face, Matthew! Woo! Ha ha! Jay! 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 I really like the other main character though, Andrew, and he's really jumped ahead in terms of emotional maturity this season. Mm, I love it when she talks dork dirty. If I were to speak from the heart, Missy, it was the most I ever made. Oh, right. As we look at him coming to terms with what I think is one of the toughest things we ever face in puberty, we choose what gratifies us about as much as we choose the color of our skin. And Andrew shows us his struggle to come to terms with what gratifies him and how it conflicts with his own self-esteem. As he finds himself deeply enthralled and having a hell of a time in a physical relationship with Lola. Against a rough denim pant. But wasn't I about to break up with her? Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Let's stay focused. I need a little pick-me-up, friend. But he doesn't necessarily feel emotionally or morally attracted to her. And he's kind of got to come to terms with what the best thing to do is there. On the subject of Lola, it was also nice to see she was encouraged out of her toxic relationship with Devin. Lola, I'm friends. What? Oh, God. Do you think Blocked. you're doing? Unsubscribe! From my makeup tutorial? I hate how you say, hey guys, when you know I'm the only one watching your stupid makeup tutorial. Oh the hormone monsters is usual hedonistic charming self. And the hormone monstrous is just as sassy and awesome as last season. There's also a really interesting, informative episode on contraception. And it not only taught me something, but it was one of Big Mouth's better episodes. Most importantly to me though, behind all the brashness and gross out jokes, there's still such a good spirit behind the show. And I really appreciate that. There's still plenty of cringe, and if you didn't like the first season, you probably won't like the second. But overall, I enjoyed Big Mouth Season 2, and I certainly found it worth giving one watch. And for number four, Hilda. Hilda's a very gentle cartoon. It reminds me of a cross between Gravity Falls and Steven Universe, while generally kind of appealing to women. It's basically about a fairly fearless young lady named Hilda, and she and her mom decide to move from the forest to the big city. I've never seen a proper parade before. You might find the city more fun than you think. And much of the rest of the series, from basically episode 3 onwards, is watching her adapt to the city and society in general. I kind of felt like it followed that weird trend of the magical girl anime genre. You basically have a girl not quite of this world who wows everyone with her weird way of thinking. That is so much bigger in films. <sighs> Got an idea. I watched about half this series and I actually liked it most till like the third or fourth episode, which is weird because it did at that point exactly what I thought it would do and wanted it to do. It took this country bumpkin girl Hilda and put her in the big city, which is what I thought I wanted. But when I look back, I actually preferred her in the forest because the forest was so much more interesting. It was such a more beautiful fantasy setting. The first three episodes particularly have this more dreamlike feel to them. It's very nature and fantasy and unknown. And I really like the feel to that. The way the horizon looked, the position of the river, 
way the air smells. To me, the forest fantasy setting is just so much more interesting than the gray concrete jungle of the city. There's nothing wrong with the city, but we've just seen that setting so many times. I feel like I've seen the young quirky girl adapting to school life so many times over the years. It just, it's not as interesting as a forest. Go back to the forest. But more importantly, the animation is still gorgeously gentle to look upon and they still managed to instill that element of fantasy into the city. For example, in one episode, Hilda's dreams are intercepted by a nightmare spirit, and she and her friends have to hunt it down. I'm trying to help David get over his fears. You're just making them worse. Overall, I definitely recommend this Netflix cartoon, though I personally would have really liked to have seen more of the forest. Number three. She-Ra. Just a note, I haven't seen the original He-Man or She-Ra, so I may be missing some really important points on how they're similar. I've enjoyed She-Ra so far, but it's hard to define. It feels like it's heavily inspired by Avatar and Legend of Korra, but it's a fair way off the sophistication level of Korra or Avatar. The animation budget's a lot lower, but I still like it, and I like what it's trying to do. It stars a young lass named Adora, who was originally part of the Evil Horde. Shadow Weaver? You have done well. But then joins the rebellion after gaining the magic sword that turns her into She-Ra. What I do like about Adora though, is she feels multi-layered and real. I'm still figuring out how all of this stuff works. It felt like there was a lot of the female perspective in this cartoon. A lot of grace called blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Adora doesn't always like to fit the feminine roles, but she also feels fine to indulge in the feminine roles sometimes too, because she enjoys them. It doesn't mean that defines her, but that's something she enjoys. It's interesting because you can look at She-Ra and see how it's generally trying to appeal to the female demographic. It has a gentler color scheme, it's generally got a lot more stuff like balls and that sort of thing, and it's more about people working together. We're clearly stronger together. Think what all the princesses united could do. It has a lot more general empathy between the characters. Everyone feels like they have some relatability, but it just doesn't quite mesh for me. I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on She-Ra. I get the impression there would be a lot of people who really like this one, and a lot of people who really don't like it. If you've seen She-Ra yourself, I'd love to know your thoughts. Feel free to leave them in the comments below. Number two. Disenchantment. I can get married or I can die. This should be a harder decision. Just a note, I haven't watched up to episode 12 yet and I've heard it gets a lot better around that point. So it may be the new seasons are much better. But I'm really tired of the Lord of the Rings fantasy setting. Oh God, I'm tired of it. The Middle Ages is not interesting to me. We get it, it sucked. And Disenchantment is just like a testament to how bored I am of the stupid Middle Ages setting. It feels like so many shows have done it and so often they're just pointing out how crappy it was back then. Maybe that's because I grew up with Dungeons and Dragons and Neverwinter Nights and all these other games, but I, I just can't stand that setting anymore. While Disenchantment certainly isn't terrible, I think it left a lot of people disappointed. And I'll explain my personal reasons that it didn't quite connect with me. Many people know it was created by Matt Groening, the creator of Simpsons and Futurama. So I think a lot of us set our bar of expectations really high. Unfortunately, 95% of the jokes didn't even make me crack a smile. I think that's partially though because Princess Bean just feels so stereotypical and unlikable to me. As Merkimer's fiance, I'd like to say a few words. Let's head back. She's a princess, and she clearly has the best life of anyone in the Middle Ages. Yet she's constantly complaining about everything. It's fine to have a princess who wants something more, but we've been seeing the princess who wants something more for 30 to 75 years now from Disney. It's a great formula, but jeebus, you've got to do something different with it. All this wedding hassle for a stupid political alliance? I thought that I'd get married for true love or because I was wasted. A princess who doesn't want to act like a princess. That, that is so dumb. I would actually prefer a character like Adora from She-Ra because she feels real. Yes, Adora doesn't always meet the traditional female roles but also really enjoys times where she can indulge in being feminine. Because from my limited understanding anyway, 
a lot of women like a combination of feminine and non-feminine because they're human beings. Weirdly enough, I feel like Matt Groening could learn a lot about female character development from Hilda, She-Ra, and Legend of Korra and Avatar. I'm not saying this cartoon's terrible. In fact, it's perfectly serviceable. <laughs> But I think we all recognize how much potential this enchantment had. The budget is clearly there when you look at the animation, but the writing has just been done so many times. But as I said, I've heard the show improve significantly by the end of the season, so season two might be a lot better. And the number one cartoon on Netflix that is modern that I feel like reviewing is Super Drags. It's... Well, it's, uh... I assembled a select group of ladyboys with amazing skills. I, I'm glad to live in a world where it can exist. And regardless of whether I like it or not, that doesn't matter because I'm not the target audience. But interestingly, I've actually heard from some LGBT communities that they find it quite an insulting show. And that's certainly understandable when you look at it. Some take it with a laugh, but understandably, some find it too over the top and think it further alienates LGBT communities from popular culture. A lot of Super Drags feels about indulgence, and I don't think that's a bad thing. They can be silly and crazy with some really good moral messages buried underneath. Sometimes a cartoon can just be a tongue-in-cheek romp with some gay co-workers posing as superheroes. As other reviewers have said, it starts off seeming like just a campy drag show. But as we get further in, we get closer examinations on topics like conversion therapy, self-esteem, child abuse, and even closeted religious leaders. And unlike Family Guy, they're not just spitting on these topics not even thinking about them. Similar to Big Mouth, they're treating these topics with care and honesty. And when treated with love and care, and Jeebus forbid from the perspective of someone who's actually been through them, these topics are definitely worth talking about in modern society. And I'm glad we have Super Drags so it can. Now don't get me wrong, Super Drags can be gross. And it can be super campy. But I think when you hear the title Super Drags, you get a reasonable idea of what you're in for. I can't personally say I like this show. Obviously, they're frat boy jokes, they're not sophisticated. Though I think sophisticated is the last thing this show is trying to be. With Super Drags, you'll know within half an episode if you'll be able to tolerate the gross out for the tongue-in-cheek, sometimes insightful comedy. I personally can't recommend this cartoon, but I'm glad it exists. Well, thanks for tuning in for this review. Looking back on 2018, I feel it's been a good year overall for animation. Much of which is thanks to streaming. I love this new experimentation and animation era. We don't have to like all these cartoons, but thank Jesus we're in a world they can exist. Come on, let's keep exploring. Encourage this weird stuff. We don't want the same stuff over and over. Anyway, I'll be trying to read as many of the comments as I can, so if you have any thoughts on these shows, I would love to hear them. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. And thanks as well for your support in 2018. Even after years, this is all still pretty surreal to me, and to still be able to do this for a living is just amazing to me, and I'm so grateful. So, thanks for listening to this weirdo talk about animation for a while.